after nearly 20 years, more than 20 years, actually, it finally happened. We did it. We got the 3D Kirby game. It's it's a dream come true for many Kirby fans because, like, they just kind of decided not to do 3D Kirby on the N64. And then whenever they thought about it, they were like, nah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Forgotten <laughs> Forgotten Land was a was a big deal. Um, and it's great that the game actually turned out to be um, really good because I don't think I could deal with another 20 years of Kirby had a rough transition to 3D. Um, I, I, As in no transition. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just weird how many tiny baby steps the franchise had to take. Because, um, well, I mean, he's a little guy, he's got no legs, they're all that is time. that is true. That that <laughs> does mean there are baby steps. Um, but Kirby 64, great game, but there's not a lot of 3D in it, like it's all 3D models if you haven't played the game. And there's like some cute, like foreground background stuff that happens, but it's a two, it's a 2D platformer. Um, like Kirby's Air Ride, you can is a racing game, you can like run around as Kirby not on the ship in City Trial, which is neat, but that's not like a a 3D a Kirby, Kirby game. game. That's <laughs> yeah. like the Sonic Jam Museum mode of 3D games, so. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and then and then Kirby was kind of handheld only for a long time uh on like GBA and DS. He was basically just, you know, uh 2D handheld games. And then aside from Return to Dreamland, which was on Wii, otherwise, yeah, yeah, and Return to Dreamland was made during the New Super Mario Brothers kind of time period where um, everything was a two D platformer, and <laughs> and three D um, Return to Dreamland, Triple Deluxe, and Robobot are all awesome, but again, there's minimal three D elements in there aside from the fact that the games do use. 3d models it's but they're just they're pretty standard 2d games oh no we woke up on insanity beach that i it's it's like this is the same exact thing as like crash crash one right like the (laughs) same it's basically the same first screen yeah but then instead of being crash it turns out that we're playing pac-man world um yeah (laughs) that's also a good game uh that i played for the first time this year it it is a pretty fantastic game, yeah. Especially now yeah. that it's got a, a smoothed out remake, it's it's a yeah. lot more accessible. It would be really nice if they remade Pac Man World Two because um, that game's like excellent. Like the first game is pretty good. The second game is excellent until you get to like the water level, which absolutely sucks all the joy and fun out of the game, <laughs> uh, as water levels tend to do. Well, who well who wants a ten minute auto scroller? it's it's like it's actually like 15 10, 15 minutes of auto scrolling and then it's followed up by the roller skating sequence which is balls hard and you haven't done real platforming in 15 minutes so you you don't know what you're supposed to be doing <laughs> um <laughs> but anyway yeah um i didn't really notice how similar the games were until i had actually played pac-man world for myself but yeah it's got a very similar vibe i would say kirby's probably a more polished game overall, and it certainly benefits from being more modern. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this uh, game. Tw- I would say twenty years worth of lessons. Yeah, it, it's the camera distance and angle, and the way that plays into the movement. It's all it's all very Pac Man world here. Yeah, um, it's like a mix between like, well, honestly, if we're talking about gameplay wise, it feels very similar to the uh, 3DS and Wii games, and I, I suppose Star Allies, even though that one's less important and memorable and good um but it feels very much like the existing kirby games it's just in 3d so it also feels kind of like crash and kind of like pac-man world and not really like mario odyssey but like mario 3d world but better i guess yeah (laughs) um that's a thing that's to the game's uh positive and negative and both at the same time in a sense because it's sticking with what worked, and therefore it's very good at what it does. Because they already know how to make a good Kirby game. But at the same time, I was hoping for that Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Metroid Prime kind of big 
this is the big new idea for 3D that we can do with Kirby now sort of thing, and it just kind of doesn't do that. Yeah. I've been thinking about that um, a good bit, and aside, Mario 64 is obviously a very different game from the 2D Mario games, mm -hmm. but uh, Metroid Prime and uh, Ocarina of Time structurally are very similar to their predecessors. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Ocarina of Time and Link to the Past are basically the same game, if not for the controls um, and the fact that it's 3D. Yeah, with, uh, with, o with Ocarina of Time, it's more like the game codified a lot of control conventions yeah. that would define 3D adventure games going forward. Um, uh, unless you were Castlevania 64, in which case you were a little late to the party and just didn't receive all those updates. Yeah. It's Kirby. <laughs> he dances. I had only when I recorded this, I had just found out that when you press the the top button, yeah, the direction buttons, like each of the mouthful modes have their own like little dance. And I did, <laughs> oh my god, angry American Kirby car. Um, but yeah, so being a 3D game released 20 years after the advent of 3D games, you know, obviously there's not going to be the same wow factor and like we were saying the basic controls are fairly similar to games that have come before it so in some ways i don't think it would ever live up to the hype so they just tried to make a really good 3d kirby like a good 3d comma kirby game in some ways in some ways um actually 3d kirby is simpler than 2D Kirby, particularly in the combat mechanics. Yes. I was a little surprised by that. But I guess they just didn't want to overwhelm the younger audiences with complex three-dimensional Devil May Cry controls, um, which is essentially what you would need to do to keep the 2D combat intact in Forgotten Land. Yeah, because, like, 2D Kirby games the in, with the superstar control scheme... Uh, first off, this anime ass opening I love. Um, they, it's, a, it's the opening thing to Perfect Strangers. They they cut it out of the demo, which I thought was the smartest idea ever, because this first level is basically just in the demo, other than this. So like, I was kind of autopiloting for, through the first level, and then they showed this, and I was like, oh my god, um, I nearly screamed. Um, one thing that I one thing that I like about this opening is that it really emphasizes the peaceful cuteness of the post-apocalypse, um, which uh, you wouldn't, which, which you know, doesn't isn't normally a sentence that makes sense. But I've played Breath of the Wild, so it makes perfect sense <laughs> to me. Um, yeah, the the nature reclaiming civilization kind of vibe is like there's a lot of it actually. Wasn't that oh god. What Ghibli movie is it where like there's plants growing I, over all I want, of the buildings? I want to say half of them, but I probably seen half of that them. Many. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen yeah. as many Ghibli movies as I probably should have. Uh, I can't remember which one I'm thinking of. Um, it's been a while. Um, we had a point. What was that? Oh yeah. So like when you're playing Superstar or Return to Dreamland or whatever, every move set basically has its own Tekken move list that you have to pause the game and read. <laughs> um, but they all have like Smash Brothers move inputs that depend yeah. on your direction, which doesn't really work as well in full 3D. So, well, I mean, it's basically how Devil May Cry controls work, but you have to hold on to an, a lock on button to make it happen. Um, yeah. And that makes like pinning down which direction you should be doing a bit of a, a complex exercise until you get used to it. Like... It's always relative to where your character is facing. So if you want to dodge to the side, you have to go left and jump. But it's left relative to where your character is facing, which could change six to seven times in any half second. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's very reflex intensive trying to get those moves to work on, uh, as intended. I'm actually fairly curious on how like the hardcore boss fight scene feels about Forgotten Land. Because with the other 2D games, the new ones, there's like a pretty substantial part of the fan base that adores the true arena and tries to and really is into the combat of the game. Um, as for me personally, I've always been more of a just replay the main adventure kind of guy. So um, I've always like not that I dislike having a lot of moves. But I've also enjoyed the simplicity of stuff like this game and 
the original Kirby's Adventure um, slash Nightmare in Dreamland and Kirby 64, um, where it was okay if, you know, moves had a little bit less individual stuff because I was more for the variety. Mm. Um, so I would be interested to know, like, if, like, people, how people, how the more, you know, like, how that segment of the fan base felt about the combat in this. Yeah, I would imagine there's some division there. But yeah. here here we have our obligatory Nintendo partner character, which has been a thing since Navi from Ocarina of Time and has never gone away. It just won't leave yeah. you alone. But they have at least mastered the art of making it a likable character. <laughs> well, as a Kirby fan, I can't help but, you know, glare suspiciously when the when the, this character first showed up based on the last few uh, cute mascot characters you've had the last few Kirby games. Man, <laughs> Marks and Magalor really gave this fan base trust issues. <laughs> I remember when they revealed this guy, everybody was like, he's going to betray us. He's going to betray... Guys, come on. Not everybody's going to betray you just because one douchebag with a beach ball did that one time. Well, two, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. okay. I suppose when it happens the second time, you... you uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that someone isn't out to get you, I guess is the saying. These kind of partner characters have been an interesting aspect of Nintendo games ever since antiquity. Because, like, for the really young crowd that are probably playing the game as one of, like, their first few games, they, like... You, you tend to get really attached to these kind of tutorial characters because they're the people teaching you how to play the game and they're with you from start to finish and you learn beside them and journey beside them and it's great. For older gamers like us, they're a complete ass sore because we already know all this shit and it feels like they're nagging us. <laughs> um, so they also, they also serve as a mouthpiece for the mute main character because Nintendo doesn't want their main characters to ever talk. Yeah, Elphalyn yeah. definitely uh, benefits from avoiding the... Um, the tutorial aspect of it because like the worst he does is like mention when a shop is open or something like that. Yeah, in and that's, the town, that's handy to know. I mean, yeah, uh, he's not shouting at you like that. Your Switch Pro controller is running out of battery or something. So, <laughs> um, Kirby, there's a thirty percent chance we can open this gate if you press the switch right in front oh, of it. God, damn Kirby it, doesn't fine. even understand what thirty percent means. Um. He just smiles and says, Poyo. Nobody likes Fi, and yet somehow everyone finds it charming that Breath of the Wild makes a reference to her. And I'm like, uh, how does that work? Oh, because of the <laughs> Zelda cycle. Everybody loves Skyward Sword now. They hate Breath of the Wild. I don't. <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard, like, people saying that they love Skyward Sword. People have re-examined it and, and thought, hey, there are parts of it that are nice. But every review that has come out in the recent years that I've seen that re-examines it in a semi-positive light always has a big fat asterisk at the end of every bit of positive praise. Like, yeah, yeah it's doing this one thing really well, but it also comes with this really annoying thing. <laughs> um, what year did Skyward Sword come out again? I want... It was later in the Wii's life cycle, but before the Wii, so I want to say 2010, 2011. It, it, okay, so the six-year-olds who played Skyward Sword first... We're born in 2004, which means that they're 18 now. So just give it time. Uh, we're already at the phase where everybody's saying that uh, Twilight Princess did nothing wrong, and it didn't. Um, what? Um, well, so, yeah. But I was. Um, I've been saying we'll get that Twilight there. Princess did nothing wrong since it came out. So yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I liked it better than Wind Waker, but that's yeah. just me. <laughs> just wait. Uh, four years from now, everybody will be saying that Breath of the Wild was bad, actually, because um, that's um, just how these video games oh, work. Look. There, there are people who have been saying that from the beginning, but... Oh, yeah, but when they were doing it in 2017, they were trying to be contrarian, um, because now, everybody... It's, yeah, it, It's less that they were trying to be contrarian, and it's more that, like, there were a lot of really big Zelda conventions that that game just threw out, and, um, yeah. you know, when... when it, it's inevitable that the people who value those parts of the Zelda experience more than others are going to really not gel with Breath of the Wild. And hopefully, Tears of the Kingdom will scratch their itch a little better. But we'll see. I'm nervous about that game because it's going to... I'm worried about it because it's going to be, you know, pot potential hype backlash because we've been waiting so long for it. Yeah. Um. To bring things back on topic a little bit, goddamn, Kirby fans are spoiled. Um. You get a new game at least once a year, sometimes twice, even if it's just a spinoff. Um, there's not really a... It hasn't really been a bad game in the series since, like, what? When did, like, like 1999 with, like, 
I would say Amazing Mirror is not very good, but uh, yeah. I mean, that game also has its fans though. So, but that was like 2002. I mean, um, I mean, I'm not a big Kirby fan, but uh, from what I understand, the quote unquote bad Kirby games are kind of the same thing as the quote unquote bad Pokemon games, where yeah, they're kind of lacking. They're they're kind of mid. But, like, even the dreariest and most dull wrote by the numbers Kirby game is, you know, still kind of a casual fun time. So it's yeah. not like the game the games ever get terrible. Yeah, like, a lot of people will tell you Star Allies is the worst Kirby game. And uh, Star Allies has the best post-game mode in the series, um, which I've played and beat every single side character on and is just... Uh, like, guest star mode is amazing. Um, so if your worst game is Star Allies, which is, like, a pretty solid... It's good. I'd play it before New Super Mario Bros. U. Um, then, yeah, your fa- your 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 the Kirby fans are spoiled. Um, Look at it. The the analogy with Pokemon just gets better and better. Now you're describing Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon to me. Um, uh, I mean, Ultra Sun... <laughs> oh, God. Um, I, we went into this a lot when we did Sun and Moon. Uh, but... I mean, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is definitely, like, if you're a competitive player, it's definitely better. Um, but they just had to screw up the thing, the best part of the first game's story uh, for some reason. And I'll never forgive it. <laughs> never forgive it for that. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Um, hopefully, by the time I pick up Scarlet and Violet, uh, they'll patch it and uh, update it with better tech performance. And then they'll update I'll have it a positive... So that- it doesn't crash every 20 minutes on native hardware. Um, um, oh, yeah, because there's, like, memory leaks, right? Um, yeah, that's that's what yeah. it sounds like to me. Like, the game runs worse the longer you play it. Um, and that's, like... I, 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 I've I played Bethesda's PS3 ports. That is classic memory leak right there. Isn't that what happened with Donkey Kong 64, but people only really started to notice it on the Wii U port? No, they finally figured it out. Figured it out. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but someone recently, I think, finally figured out what was going on there. Oh, really? What was going on? It, it has something to do with just reading the hardware. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look it up. Okay, because um, it was like Donkey Kong 64 on Wii U. If you left it on for too long and didn't like, actually shut it off. Yeah, because like when you play a game on the Wii U Virtual Console and you save it and you like go back to the home screen, it saves your progress right there. So. Like, the game on the insect as you're playing it never thinks that it's been turned off. So there's, um... Or maybe oh. I'm thinking of Paper Mario 64. That game's also held together no, by DK64 also did that. Did, uh, uh, basically, if you play, if you booted up your save on the save state, it basically reads that the system, the system, quote-unquote, has never been turned off. Yeah. So basically, if you want to play DK64 on the Wii U, you have to save the normal way, quit out, and then don't use your save state, just boot the game up normally. Well, I mean, you can use your save state for, like, emergency reloads, but you have to remember to um, shut the game off, save properly, you know, every once in a while, and then replace the save state. So that it's you not... You dang it, kids today, never knowing what it's like, having to actually stop and find a save point. <laughs> Shaw. Um, you and your auto saves. I mean, it's interesting because, like, save points are apparently enough of a tradition in um, in video games that some games will insist on having them even if they let you quick save at any time without restriction. And, like, I was playing Tales of Berseria right before Pokemon Scarlet and Violet completely derailed me, and I'm gonna have to start that game over now. Thanks, Nintendo. Um, uh, but like the RPG trap. <laughs> but like uh, Tales of Berseria has a quick save system that lets you save anywhere, and it also has save points. There is no penalty whatsoever for using the quick save system, other than the fact that you can only have one at a time. Um, so why why are there save points again? Um, so Dragon <laughs> Quest does that as well. Um, the particularly the remakes of the old games, uh, they have a really really good quick save system, and they keep the save points from like back when it was on the SNES and you needed them. Uh, but Dragon Quest Eleven does that as well, where you can save wherever you want, but there's also save points. Um, it's a game design thing, um, particularly with long games like that, 
you want to have a point where players feel like they can turn the game off, you know, and they're so not. It basically, it's basically there to signal the players that this is a good place to take a break. Yeah, it's like yeah. chapters in a book. Like, there's nothing really saying that a book needs chapters, you know, aside from if the book, like, if it's from the perspective of one character, there's like a million different types of books. But, okay, you yeah, know, like Harry sense. Potter doesn't really need chapters, but it has them so that you can have a point to stop reading for the night, you know, and you don't feel like you have to. As a matter of fact, forward. that is an important part because Harry Potter started writing um, at a time when children's literature wasn't what wasn't allowed to be quite so big so the structuring of children's books tended to be something closer to a series of short stories than a traditional novel with chapters would be so each chapter tended to have a sort of little arc of its own and you can see this in a lot of books that were published before harry potter but a lot of children's books that were published after harry potter dropped that structure yeah, because the, at that point they realized children are not just dumber versions of adults, and they can actually like <laughs> read a normal book. <laughs> you yeah. know, it just has to interest them. <laughs> yeah. I right. well, this has been part one of Kirby and the Forgotten Land, in which we maybe talked about Kirby for a third of the time. So business as usual on this channel, I guess. Honestly, I think our our on average we were doing better than normal. So I'm proud of us. <laughs> I'm proud of us too.